do a little more in 16.4 and a bunch of stuff in 16.5. Um, homework up three to four today in the dining hall. Food systems talk in Gates uh, for the uh, first job candidate. That's 4 to 5.30. And then pizza dinner for students only who wish um, with the food systems candidate. I think that's down in the ES classroom. It's usually where it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then homework help for me the usual times, Thursday and Friday. Um, and I'm going to have hours from 4 to 5.30 today Ooh. instead of on Thursday night. Not tomorrow, yeah, sorry. Um, I have to move things around. Both of these times I think I can stay a little later if needed. Um, and I would be free certainly after class on Friday as well. So anyway, if, yeah. if these times don't don't work or if you're, um, you know, as usual, let, let me know. Yeah. All right. Um, so I want to start by recapping what we did last time and do, have you guys do one more example. And then we'll go from 2D back into 3D. So we've looked at integration in two dimensions. And we've done it in terms of Cartesian coordinates. Right, and so just the picture there is you want to know it's got some rapid density x y, and then we're, we want to add up the total number of rabbits, and the rabbit density is not constant all over the world. We'd like to just do area times density, but we can't because the density isn't constant. But that's okay. Integrals let us add up things that are changing while we add them up. So if we do that in Cartesian coordinates, we get these little rectangles. And the size of these little rectangles <coughs> are all the same. So that was sort of nice. We never really even had to think about them. If we want to do polar coordinates, which it will often be convenient to do, um, so now we're specifying a point in space not by x and y, but r and theta. So this distance here is r. And then theta is the angle from the positive x-axis. And then um, our little boxes have different sizes depending on where we are. So the area element there, instead of being right, so here, it's just um, it's a rectangle. It's dx, dy. For polar coordinates, it's r, d, r, d, theta. And this r is a real r. It's not just something you need to write down to make it look OK. This R then enters into whatever function you're integrating, as we saw last time. But it's easy to sometimes think this is just sort of like window dressing or a fake R. It's a real R. Um, so polar coordinates is a different um, system of coordinates. And so it's important to know how to translate from Cartesian coordinates, or old friend x and y, into polar coordinates. And this is sort of the bilingual dictionary. This tells us, you give me R and theta, I can figure out x and y. And this says, you give me x and y, and we can figure out r and theta. So it lets us go back and forth between the two. Um, so over here on the left board, this is what you need to know in order to set up iterated integrals in um, two dimensions, in polar coordinates. So So we did some examples last time. My impression was okay. So let's do one more. This will be a little, little interesting and hopefully a little bit fun. And then we will go up to dimension and then talk about spheres. So, so, so let me say something about about the limits for this, since that's one of the that's sort of tricky things. So x is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Y is going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So that means we're integrating over everything, the entire plane. You want to know now all the rabbits in the entire universe. Um, so we could imagine um, breaking the entire universe up into, into these little rectangles. And then we'll have these areas, dx, dy, and add all, all the rabbits. Uh, now we need to do the same thing. We have like polar coordinates. We want to like express the entire plane in polar coordinates. So r is going to have to go from 0 all the way up to infinity. And so then theta is going to have to start at 0, and you're going to have to sort of sweep that all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. So the r limit is 
0 to infinity, and this is 0 to 2 pi. So, does that, make, does that make sense? Okay. Then I, won't, then I won't try to explain it because I may mess it up. All right. So now we have an integral to do. Yeah. Let's do this integral, and it'll sort of be an interesting number, and uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be fun. So, um, let's let's talk through this. There's a, there's a lot of things to talk about, and then I want to take this result and do something fun with it. Um, so, we talked about taking this and then converting this into polar. And then we have an interval to do. So, so, we'll do the r first. So, we need the antiderivative of e to the minus r squared r. And you can do this with a u substitution, or you can notice, which is sort of what a u substitution is, like, hey, this kind of looks like something I'll get from the chain rule. Oh, you know what? I think the antiderivative of r e to the minus r squared is just e to the minus r squared. Because the derivative of e to the minus r squared is e to the minus r squared. And then the derivative of the inner function is minus 2r. So, oh, nice, I've got this r there. But not so nice, there's just minus 2 hanging out here. Ah, so not quite. But oh, I see what I can do. The antiderivative of r e to the minus r squared is minus a half e to the minus r squared. Then this minus a half will nullify this minus 2, and I'll end up with r e to the r squared. So this is indeed the anti this is indeed the antiderivative of that. Okay. <laughs> so I mean I so I sort of like wrote out my thought process. This is sort of like the trial and error um, um, sort of approach. Alright, so now we need to um, use the antiderivative to evaluate the interval. So I'm going to do the inner one first. And so antiderivative evaluated from 0 to infinity. Okay, so antiderivative evaluated from 0 to infinity. Okay, so because I'm a physicist, I like to write this, which just means, you know, like plug in infinity. You can't really plug in infinity because infinity is not a number. But you can kind of pretend it is sometimes. And so infinity, whatever it is, it's really big. Infinity squared surely will be bigger e to the minus something really huge is zero. Because, right, e to the, e to the minus x, right, that's a decaying exponential. Um, if you're around mathematicians, like actual mathematicians, and maybe on, on AP or IB exams you would have had to have written it this way, what this means is you've got e to the minus b squared, or whatever letter you and what happens to that as b gets larger and larger and larger? The answer is that this gets closer and closer and closer to zero. So, you, so the mathematician would say you can't really plug in infinity. And the physicist would say, you know what, you can pretend you plug infinity and you're going to get the right answer all the time. So let's just do it that way and it'll be OK. Is that, is that step OK? All right. This, e to the 0, that's 1, minus minus is positive, And ah, we get a half. That's nice. No r's anymore because we've done the r integral. Now we just have a theta integral to do. This is just a constant. Antiderivative of a half is theta over 2 from 0 to 2 pi gives me pi. So what does that mean? Like there are pi rabbits in the universe? Yeah, so if this, if this, was, <laughs> if this was a rabbit density, um, and uh, so if this was a rabbit density, this, this has a peak at the origin and then decays very rapidly in x and y. Um, there would be um, pi rabbits. Or the area under this surface is pi. But wait, there's more. It will get more interesting. All right, so, um, So let's go, let's go back to this. And maybe you've noticed when you're doing these integrals that when, well, let me write, let me write this like this first. E to the minus x squared, e to the minus y squared, dx dx. So I just did a little algebra on this term. And you've noticed maybe when doing these integrals 
that like, since y, this part is just a constant to x, and this part is just a constant to y, that um, you can end up thinking of it like, not thinking of it, just doing it this way. function sort of separates out this way, it's a product of two other things. You basically got two integrals that end up getting multiplied together. Not, the x and y's aren't mixed together. So those both, are those both, each half of those equal to the square root of y? Yeah, right, so these are actually the same thing. y is a dummy variable, x is a dummy variable. Um, so I claim that the, these are the same, so I could write this as, Function here, is that, is that at all familiar? E to the minus x squared wouldn't be familiar from this class. Statistics, that's a bell curve. Or that's a normal distribution. Not normalized, but it's a normal, I mean, it's an unnormalized normal distribution. It looks like this. So the formula for a normalized bell curve, normal distribution, you've probably seen that at some point. Um, the punchline, somebody has seen that distribution. And there's a square root pi in there. You remember? <laughs> okay. um, all right, let me, uh, I, always, I always forget. So the normal distribution is um, so standard deviation of sigma mu of mu. And so somebody, somebody, perhaps not unlike me, has written this board at some point. But actually, unlike me, it was in a stats class. And there was this there, and maybe somebody said, how does this get there? And probably the stats professor said, I have no idea. I mean, it's weird. Like, how in the world does a square root pi emerge from this? I think that's really weird. But anyway, now you know. <laughs> um, So, I mean, so there's a bunch of steps to go from here to here, but, uh, but not, it's a couple of, you know, it's a couple of use substitutions. But anyway, you can see where the square root of pi is going to appear. It's not, I mean, maybe it is magic, but cool magic, yeah. Aren't the, um, aren't the like, uh, topology lines, I forgot what they're called, uh -huh. but they just contour lines, yep. yes. If you're looking like top down, aren't they just concentric circles though? In the three-dimensional graph, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is yeah. that pretty much where pi is coming from in that case? No, because like if we were to figure out the area, I mean, if I were to replace this with x to the fourth, I would still have this would just smoosh this down a little bit, yeah. and the, the the contour lines would still be circles. But I don't think you would have a here in quite the same way. Me. 
It's certainly, it would certainly be more complicated than just than just five. I mean, it's it's not the it's not the case that every <coughs> this is true. I don't know that you're guaranteed to have a pi appear in every radially symmetric uh, function like this. But when you think in, when you start thinking in polar coordinates, I mean, okay, so by that I mean you have a situation where there's no theta dependence in here. So you're going to get a 2 theta, a 2 pi from your, um, from this integral no matter what, even if this is some crazy, crazy thing. So unless this somehow has a pi that emerges from it that cancels this pi, you're probably going to get a pi out of it. Um, so I think it's sort of neat. And the other, the other thing this relies on is you're converting, you're taking a one-dimensional problem. And, oh, and by the way, this integral also is one you cannot do by hand. Not because it's hard, because it's impossible. This function, e to the minus x squared, has no closed form antiderivative. That's one of those moments in Calc 2 when you realize, oh, this is different than Calc 1. Like, you can integrate everything. You can't exactly antiderivate. So there's no way, to, the only way I know to do this, pretty, in one way or another, convert this into a 2D problem, do this trick, square root, and go back into 1D. All right, so, oh boy. Um, so what I want to do next is um, move into three-dimensional integrals which I've already done in Cartesian coordinates, and now do them in curvilinear coordinates. Um, and so I suspect, so we'll, we'll get fairly far today, and we'll probably then need to finish this up on Friday, which is, which is totally fine. Um, all right, so I'm going to attempt to draw a series of increasingly complicated pictures in three dimensions, and then I also have a few nicer figures that at some point I might project on the screen. We also might see how my by hand figures work. If, like, it's a really good day for drawing for me, we might not need these, which is why I haven't pulled the screen down. But I don't know, the phrase, like, if it's a really good day for drawing for me, almost always ends up it's not. We'll just see. So, Let's remind ourselves what we're doing with volume intervals. So now we're integrating over volume, and so the story we've used before is now instead of counting rabbits, we're counting butterflies, things that can fly. Um, you could also think of this as chemical concentration. You have some density for, for pollutants in air. You could think of this as charge distribution on some three-dimensional um, uh, dielectric or something. So and we want to know what's the total number of butterflies or toxins or electric charge on some region, some, some volume. And so, well, we've got density and we've got volume, and so density times volume gives you stuff, butterflies or mass or charge. Um, but the problem is that the density is changing. It's not constant all over the space. So that's okay. Intervals are what we use when we're adding up things that are changing when we add them up. And so we need to kind of go around and break space up into little regions of volume, which so far have been little cubes. And we imagine space being filled with these tiny little cubes. And then we can figure out the number of butterflies or electric charge or mass in all of these cubes and add up all the cubes, and that's the interval. Um, OK, so it will be convenient um, at times to use other coordinate systems. And so there are two popular three-dimensional curvilinear coordinate systems. And the first one is cylindrical coordinates, which is not so bad. None of them are bad, but let's see what L and A are. Cylindrical. Okay. 
here's x, and here's y, there's z. And the idea is we're going to specify a point in space not with x, y, and z, but with r, theta, and z. So it's like polar coordinates down here, and then just with an altitude thrown in. Can you reset the set for some uh, Sure. So we're, it's, it's like polar coordinates. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't sure. Like I didn't know. Like was that a was that a comma or an a? Did I use a conjunction? I wasn't sure where the sentence is. Um, so in Cartesian coordinates, we specify a point in space by x, y, z. In cylindrical coordinates, we'll specify a point in space um, by r, theta, and z. So let's see here. So there's r. There's a theta. So here's a point x, y, z, or r, theta. So sometimes it's not obvious which is which is which is easier. Um, sometimes an, inter you know, an interval that looks like it would be bad in one system turns out to be a lot better in another. Um, you know, so if you had if you had say um, a charged wire and you wanted to know the electric field here, or something, maybe. Um, if you had uh, let's say let's say this was a Let's say you had a, uh, this was a, a heating element, a hot wire, and so you would have then temperature that would depend only on how far you were from the wire. Um, then that would be a natural sort of setup for cylindrical coordinates. Um, and sometimes it might be you have some weird thing to integrate over, but you want it. But the, the volume you're integrating is itself cylindrical. So sometimes it's because of the function you're integrating, and sometimes because it's because of the region you're integrating over. Um, and we'll do. I mean, we'll do a few examples in both cylindrical and then spherical. Um, this is a sort of. This is a part, of course, where I feel like, like, chapter sixteen in general, but particularly sixteen four and sixteen five for linear coordinates, could be like an entire course, or maybe half a course. I mean, there's a lot of stuff one can do with different ways of integrating functions in different coordinate systems. So we'll do some examples, but I'm going to try not to like get bogged down here. Um, okay, so we need to know, just like we did with polar coordinates, we need to know how to convert from one coordinate system to another. So, um, the nice thing about cylindrical coordinates is they're basically the same thing as polar coordinates. So x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and z is z. Truer equation was never written. <laughs> But this actually is more interesting than it looks, because this says like z in one language happens to be the same as z in the other language. Um, so if you're, if you're specifying this point, and so one your friend is using cylindrical, and you're using Cartesian, you're going to agree on z, because z is z. It's just the same z. Uh, all right. I'm wondering if I sort of thought I would. In All right. So let me um, let me introduce the volume element. Okay. So dx dy dz. Well, I guess let me introduce it a couple ways. So we, if we're setting up an integral, we need to know what our volume element is, and so dz is dz, because z is z. And dx dy, well, that's really just polar. And we've already decided, for your acquiescence to the fact, that dx dy is already already theta. 
So dv is r dr d theta dz. Alright, so what does that look like? Treat it as a cube, even though one of the sides is microscopically curved. And that's the same thing we did in, in 2D and polar coordinates. We treated it, we treated that as a square, even though technically this is a tiny bit curved. But um, in the limit that dr and theta get really small, it becomes more and more square-like. So let's. Let's try the following. Let's let's do the the problems on the sheet that are cylindrical in nature, and we'll see we'll see how it goes. We'll need to talk through this a bunch, but to, so start with two a, and then I think four, five, and six. Sorry, four, two a, four, and five. Let's try those. Let's. Let's talk through these. So, um, in cylindrical coordinates, if we fix z at three, what is, what is that shape going to look like? It's going to look like a plane. Um, and in Cartesian coordinates, if we fix z at three, what's that going to look like? Also a plane, right? Because of this profound statement. Um, Okay, so what about what if we what if we fixed theta at a particular value? So if theta was pi over six, that's also going to be a plane, um, and it'll be whatever it is, thirty degrees this way or whatever pi over six is, and then it would include all z values up and down, and then r all all r values. Um, it's it's um, it's a it's a half plane, though, okay. meaning it doesn't go back into the board. Because r is only r, uh, r is always positive, so this is gonna. So we fix theta, and then all z values up and down, and r va all, all r values, which have to be positive, so it's gonna be coming out this way, but it's not gonna be like that. Um, if theta is whatever it is pi, then that's in the negative x direction, the, the half plane in the negative x direction. And what if, what if r is 4? What's that called? Uh, a, a, a cylinder. So r is 4, so that's all of these are about, so r is 4, theta can be anything, so that sweeps out the circle, but z can be anything, so then that's going to make an infinite cylinder up and down the radius 4. So if you fix, hold constant, 
one of the coordinates in any coordinate system, you get a surface. In Cartesian coordinate systems, you fix one coordinate system, you get a plane this way, this way, or that way. In cylindrical coordinates, you can get a plane in the z direction, you can get a cylinder, or you can get a half plane in the theta direction. Okay, so um, now some integrals. If I want to count up all the rabbits in this sphere, or all the electric charge in this sphere, um, R is going to go from time, theta, U pi, U pi, the all around circle, and then Z zero to N. Yep. And so, depending on what we have in here, that looks like a not terrible integral to do because you're, you've learned at this point that it's nice when these are constants. And it's less nice sometimes, particularly when they're like big square root things up here. The square root things up here go downstairs, and then, oh no, you have to integrate them. Sometimes it works out okay, sometimes it's a mess. So if you have a problem with cylindrical geometry, cylindrical coordinates are a good thing to try for this, for this reason. Um, all right, so now let's look at number five. So here, um, r is now no longer a constant. r depends on z. For different z values, I'm going to have different r values. I'm going to start, I will start at zero, and then I'm going to go out and to some distance, and how far out I go is different for different z values. So I need to know the uh, equation of this line. And the equation of that line will be? And the reason, so this is just a line with a slope of one, obviously not drawn to scale. Um, you run nine, you rise nine. And it starts at the origin. Um, so then, what are my limits going to be here for r? Where do I start? Where do I end? Zero to z. Zero to z, yeah. I'm always starting at zero, and then how far out I go depends on how uh, on my altitude z. In order to sweep out the entire um, each the entire circle, I need to go from zero all the way to two pi. And then I need to do this from 0 to 9. Um, so again, the nice thing about this is there are no square roots, up, big square root expressions up in the limits. Um, I've been writing at RDR to theta dz, but you have the freedom to do this integral in whatever order you feel is most convenient, but you'll have to change these as well. So now you have uh, you choose two, six different ways. Possible orders you could choose this. Freedom is fantastic. Um, okay, so these are cylindrical coordinates. What I want to do now is talk about spherical coordinates. And um, this is one of these times where it's it's a little bit confusing, I, I think. So this is good. Like, let's get we can be confused today, and then on Friday we'll be less confused. I'm not even going to say like not confused at all on Friday. I want to set expectations. Um, so these are these are a little tricky, and it takes a little while to kind of learn to see them, and they're especially tricky for me for a reason I will explain momentarily. All right. So, uh, and again, depending on how this goes. I may just project some nice pictures on the screen or, or email them out at the end of class. So I'll leave this here. And okay, so coordinate systems. Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z gives a point in space. Cylindrical coordinates are theta and z gives a point in space. 
and um, we can convert from one to the other. And spherical coordinates is another way of specifying a point in three dimensional space. And it involves two angles and one distance. So here's a point in space. And so I could refer to this point in space by saying, like, how to get to that point, how far down from the North Pole do you have to go? In what direct, in what angle in this direction, so along the equator, do you have to go? And then how far out from the origin do you have to go? And So this is, this is a phi, this is a theta. Um, sometimes these are drawn. I like, I actually enjoy both, so it just sort of depends on my mood. <laughs> Script phi or, or a uh, non-script phi. All right, so, so I want to specify a point in space. Phi and theta give me two angles, sort of like latitude and longitude. And then you would also need to know, well, how far from the center of the Earth or the center of the system are you? Are you on the surface? Are you underground? Are you up in the air? So those three numbers give you, um, specify this point in space. Um, so the thing that's a problem for me, which is not a problem for you yet, but maybe become a problem, but not in this class, is um, you already may be thinking, gee, it might be a little confusing to keep these two angles apart. Well, in physics, physicists always use, call phi theta and theta phi. So, so I learned this first in Calc 3 and probably forgot it like a long time ago. And then you do lots and lots of integral and spherical coordinates in physics classes where this is phi and that's theta. And now I'm doing math classes where this is phi and that's theta. And so it's these things, like, I feel like, it, for me, this is, again, this is, this is not going to reflect you, because you're just in math class now, and this is probably the person who's doing this. But I'm sort of so confused about phi and theta that I'm sort of like, I'm never going to get it straight. It's like, I don't know if there's, um, I can't, I don't know enough languages, but like, if, if there's something like that is one thing in French and another thing in Spanish, and like, what, and like, and then once you, like, <laughs> Once you encounter that, you realize like, I'm never going to be able to say that word in French or Spanish again because I'm always going to be confused if I'm in French or Spanish. So it's sort of one of those things. Anyway, um, and it also seems, it's also just one of these weird frozen accents. Just think, like, I don't know why. This actually, I hate to say it, but the math one actually makes more sense. As a physicist, it pains me to say that. Um, because this theta is actually the same as that theta. So that actually... You know, so good for math for getting that. All right. So anyway, we've got two angles, and that's if you know the angles that that um, you can get anywhere um, So right. So, so two angles, and then this distance tells you how far you are from the center here. Um, you might, okay, so you may be wondering about this. This is the Greek letter rho. Rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And you would probably like to call that r. And to be honest, I would too. And that's also a physics thing. But again, the, this is a math convention. And this sort of makes sense. Because... 
like you might say, well, this is r. This is a radius. Like this would be the radius of the sphere. Why don't we call it r? Well, the answer is that this r is different than this r. So it actually makes sense to use a different letter for it. Right? So over here, r squared is still x squared plus y squared. But in physics, we still usually call this r squared anyway. Maybe because rho is density all the time. All right, so the last thing to say about this, and then me, um, okay, it's not the last thing to say about this. So phi is gonna go from zero to pi, and theta is gonna go from zero You might think two angles, each should go from 0 to 2 pi, because that's what angles do. However, if we did that, we would end up double counting or, or having multiple. We want each point in space to have a unique coordinate. And this is required for that to be the case. So let me. Explain that. Let's think what it would take to describe, sort of like describe all of space or all of a sphere with these uh, coordinates. So, phi, that's the distance from the North Pole. So I could have like phi go down, you know, phi is going to sweep down in this direction, and then theta, that's the, the, um, the longitudinal direction, and that goes from all the way from 0 to 2 pi. And so that's how I'm able to describe points that are behind me. And if I go down here, I can still, right, that's how I can describe points that are behind me. I don't need, I don't also need phi to go past pi. So phi, here's pi over 2, here's pi. I don't need to have, I can't go all the way there. I don't need to have phi go back here because I already was able to get here by letting theta go greater than pi. Okay. You did it. <laughs> Please don't ask me to do it again. <laughs> Either my mind or my shoulder will explode. Um, okay. So let's 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 wrap things up with a comforting example. Um, so let's. Um, oh, no, we're not ready to be comforted. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, we need to know how to convert between these two languages. And so right, we've got this dictionary over here, um, uh, cylindrical to Cartesian. We want a similar dictionary over here. And I'm going to state this and then, in a handwriting way, attempt to derive it. So x is rho sine phi cosine theta, y is rho sine phi sine theta, and z is rho cosine phi, yes. So again, at one point in my life, I had these deeply memorized with theta and phi interchange. Which is why I don't ever trust myself to do it off the top of my head. Far, we might as well this out. So, okay, so here, so for this point in space, here's the z coordinate. Um, this is supposed to be. Uh, Here's the z-coordinate, the altitude of this point in space. 
rho is the hypotenuse, phi is the angle, z is the adjacent side, which is how we end up with this. Down here, here's y and here that is. So what we need to do is take rho. Can we make the other way? Yes. Uh, so I need to take this, and this is also a right triangle. And this is phi, that's phi, by some geometry angle, side, side angle, something, parallel line. Right? <laughs> and so this side is the opposite, and so this dashed line is rho sine phi. So then here's theta, let me put this here. So then x is adjacent, and so we have cosine theta, but the hypotenuse is rho sine phi. So that's how we go x, y, if, if you know rho, that's how we get x, y, and z. Um, I'm not sure we're going to, gonna, I'm hoping to avoid having to dig into these formulas a ton, but it's important to know that this is, you know, these relationships. And so the thing you're all wondering is, holy crap, I'm going to have to do integrals in this apparently. <laughs> what is this going to look like? Well, let, let me show you. <laughs> um, and again, this is something that I memorized in the other language, so always. Sine phi d rho d phi d from two places. Okay. So, we've got a little rectangular thing up here, and we want to know what's its volume. So as I change rho, that's just going to give me my d rho piece. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to have, uh, there, and this one has two curvy sides to it. There's a curvy side associated with this, and there's a curvy side associated with that. So the curvy side associated with this, that's like polar coordinates, that's a rho d phi. So that's yeah. this piece. And then there's a curvy piece associated with d theta, but in the theta direction, rho is not all of rho, it's rho sine phi of rho. So it's, okay, so there's a dr piece, that's this. So the, there are times I wonder, like, if a tour group walked by. Like, <laughs> often, it's th often it's things that I'm saying, like, so all the rabbits die. You know, like, sort of wonder. It happens more in, um, that when I teach down in turrets, because tour groups come through there all the time. And then, like, cruise ships, the, like, they yeah. come and do that. So oh, I sort of, like, wonder. But anyway, this is a time, like, somebody just walked by. Anyway. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's the delta rho, that's this part of this rectangle. Then, you know, let's sort of try to line up this way. Then there's the delta phi, that would be this part, that also probably doesn't look not great optics on this one. Um, and then if I'm moving this way in the theta direction, it's really just this.
this distance, in effect, it's like this distance that's moving, this shorter distance, and this shorter distance here. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you're in the video. Uh, um, is rho sine phi. So, so this is the volume element in spherical coordinates. And again, it really is convenient sometimes to do things in spherical coordinates as opposed to um, Cartesian coordinates. But I, that will take some convincing. So what I think we'll do next time is I'll um, maybe have, again, I don't want to spend too much time der deriving this. Maybe the mine version I just did or interpretive dance is probably about as good as it's going to get. But I can show you a few more pictures of this and then, we should be, and then we'll do a couple of examples um, of integrals in both cylindrical and spherical coordinates and we'll let the dust settle. So I can stick around for a few minutes but I have faculty meeting a little bit after 11. Um, and then I'll be available to, this afternoon 3 or 4.